Hello, I'm Tim Weaving, a PhD student at University College London, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the 32nd instalment in Comp Biomed's e-seminar series in collaboration with the Virtual Physiological Human Institute, or VPHI. This project is funded via the EU Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme with grant number 823712, for which we are grateful. The talk today will be given by Dr. Daniele Tatarini a senior research software engineer in the Department of Computer Science and the Insignia Institute for In Silico Medicine at the University of Sheffield. His research interests concern methods of accelerating reliable simulations in computational biomedicine with a particular focus on digital twins and software as a medical device. The talk today will cover the use of containers as an improved virtualization solution that is moreover compatible with cloud-based high-performance computing with some experiences of using containerized biomedical applications in the pursuit of the human digital twin. Now, before we begin, I'd like to briefly remind you that the session is being recorded and will be available on the Comp Biomed website and YouTube channel shortly. So please do use this to go back over parts of today's talk and others in the series, and maybe even share these e-seminars with your friends and colleagues. There's going to be a Q&A session at the end of the talk today, so please save your questions until then. Once the talk is finished, you can post your questions in the Ask the Staff a question panel accessible via the question mark icon on your screen, and I will read them out to Daniele to keep the session running smoothly. Now, that is enough from me. I very much hope that you enjoy today's talk. And finally, Daniele, please feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation for this seminar. So I'm going to present you a brief introduction of the Insignia Institute and the Combiomed incubation process. And uh, after the presentation will be about containers, the technology, the industrialization, <clears throat> they use in HPC, and how we use them for containerizing a parallel framework for image registration. The last part of the presentation will be how this uh, technology can be useful for the virtual human twin, and in particular will uh, uh, refer to the EDIT CSAE project uh, and a couple of other initiatives, which is the Bank of Sustainable Software and the Virtual Human Twin platform. So I'm with the Insigno Institute for In Silico Medicine. It's an institute of the University of Sheffield and in partnership with the Doncaster Teaching Hospital, Chef Teaching Hospital and Sheffield Children Foundation Trust. It's one of the largest institutes in Europe for In Silico Medicine and it counts uh, over 290 academics, researchers and clinicians. They bring together expertise in uh, biomedical imaging, healthcare data, AI, computational modeling, and digital healthcare technologies in general. It's quite interdisciplinary, and there are mainly two uh, uh, entities in this partnership, which is the engineering Institute and then um, teaching hospitals. And uh, it's very interdisciplinary because it, it uh, collects uh, uh, different faculties, uh, which can collaborate together under the same umbrella plus the Advanced Manufacturing Center in Sheffield. The three, three teaching hospitals are in partnership of this uh, institute and then um, as a close relationship with them. The combined project is about um, taking research applications from the, uh, their development till uh, the maturity uh, period for the exascale uh, generation of computers. Uh, clear, there are three stages in this uh, uh, let's say graduation process. So the first one is the development as a researcher of the application and where you optimize the algorithm and get feedback from the users. And the second stage in uh, is where the combined project starts is when you start, uh, you start optimizing the software and uh, making better software uh, reliable and with quality assurance, documenting the software, making sure it's reproducible and making sure that it uh, meets the fair uh, software uh, principle. It is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The last step in this graduation process is to make the software optimized to run an uh, HPC system. So parallelizing of the software, making uh, uh, running container be ready to be deployed in HPC, and preparing for the challenge of running on Exascape machines. So the key technology we're talking here is the virtualization technology. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, virtual machines. So virtual machines is basically uh, a virtual computer. You install in this machine uh, the system, operating system you want, the libraries you want, the application you want. And this allows you to run, for example, a Linux application, a Windows uh, computer. 
Uh, this is achieved thanks to an hypervisor, which basically translates uh, processes from the virtual machine to make it run on the host hardware. There is a drawback for this solution, which is the virtual machine occupies a lot of disk space because you have to have the operating system inside. But also there is an overhead due to the uh, translation of the hypervisor. Uh, another solution which applies uh, to Linux systems is our containers. It's not uh, completely new, it's an, an old, it comes from an old technology, which is like uh, um, chroot and the Linux containers. And basically, they rely on the fact that uh, uh, Linux systems, they share the same, con uh, uh, same kernel, at least uh, other kernels, if you, we take them as a reference. So the idea is that instead of uh, um, copying in the virtual machine all the kernels, you don't have to do that because it's the same uh, operating system. So the virtualization for the container with the containers is very lightweight. And actually the container engine does a kind of an administrative role because it doesn't translate anything because uh, the software inside the container actually run natively on the host uh, system because it is the same kernel. So the disk occupancy is uh, uh, lower than what you expect for a virtual machine. When we started uh, selecting the best, uh, let's say, containerization uh, product, uh, we had in mind uh, uh, the use of, of uh, uh, computer simulation for in silicon medicine. So the need to have uh, uh, large scale simulations. So one of the constraints we had is that uh, you know, whatever technology we were looking at, they need to support uh, uh, HPC and MPI message passage message passing interface. Um, such that you can run simulation on clusters, but also we need the support for GPUs and uh, um, the possibility to run the simulation on large HPC systems. So the solution that we adopted is Singularity because that meets all these requirements, but there are also other available. The key point is also that uh, with Singularity, which is now called the Obtainer, uh, you can use uh, Docker images. So Docker images, Docker container, um, can be run in singularity, and both uh, technologies that embrace the open container, container initiatives, such that to have a, a standardized uh, um, format. So the basic process to create a container is straightforward. You work on a <clears throat> your machine, which is the building machine, and uh, to create a container, you have a, a simple text file where inside you actually do what you will do on a, a shell in your computer. So defining the variables and the instruction to build and compile your application. So inside this file, you declare which is the base uh, Linux distribution you want to use. The instruction to do it is just uh, as simple as this one, the container build uh, name of the image you want to create and the source definition of file. Once you create this image, you can run <clears throat> this image on any platform that uh, uh, has uh, obtainer or singularity as a, a container engine. Uh, if the machine is, uh, uh, let's say, a workstation, it's very straightforward and there are no, uh, let's say, drawback. The problem starts if you change machine and need to be aware which is the target architecture of the machine you're going to run your container. For example, if you compile your, you build your container for an Intel uh, CPU, uh, you need to have, and you have a distribution machine, which is a, a power machine or an ARM machine, then that doesn't work. You have to create the correct combination of architecture. Um, also, if you compile the application inside the container, and the target, and you need to be aware that which is the target architecture. So you will need to um, adopt some uh, strategies to have uh, like cross compilation to make sure that you build the correct binary for the target machine. As I was saying, uh, the container are a fair solution to a problem which is uh, being findable. So you can share your container through a different hub like Docker Hub or Singularity Hub and GitHub as well. And uh, they can be accessible because uh, you can download or use a command line interface, or you can include them in any definition file to build up other containers. The interoperability is guaranteed by the fact that, that uh, they are striving to adopt uh, 
an open format, which is open container initial format. And they are reusable. The only um, need to be aware that uh, uh, as long as the machine is, uh, let's say, user machine, it's uh, very easy to reuse and reproduce uh, anywhere. If the container starts having, uh, let's say, uh, constraint like uh, uh, HPC uh, libraries like MPI or uh, network libraries for uh, interconnection, uh, uh, large HPC machine, HPC machines, then we we'll end up having some troubles. So we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about this later. Has to be bear in mind that uh, we're talking about uh, uh, Linux uh, containers. So as long as we work on Linux, so they're fine. But if you want to run containers on machines like uh, OS X or Windows, then you need to use a virtual machine basically inside the, uh, these two systems because there is, there is no kernel there. So the constraint would be that for uh, macOS, you need to have a uh, virtual machine engine uh, that works on the type of processor you have. And for Windows, you need to have at least a Windows subsystem for Linux. So the promise is that uh, a container can run, a, you build once and they run everywhere. It's not exactly as, as this, the, uh, the expectation of really satisfied. We see why. So we had, uh, we applied and we got uh, uh, access to the Trace uh, supercomputers. So we got one million core hours in Sineca on the Galileo under the system for scalable computing, cloud computing, and in Julich on the Julich uh, scalable computing. So we wanted to test um, uh, if containers can be used in HPC, large HPC system, and what were the problems. So it's important to know that for the Jureka computer, we have processor AMD and the backbone for uh, interconnection, which is an NVIDIA Mendanox. The obtainer version is 1.24, and uh, these are the constraints of this machine. So clearly, when you build a container, you need to be aware that you're building for this machine. Um, for, uh, for Zureka, uh, they support obtainer, but they don't offer uh, active support for people willing to containerize their application. So you need to build the obtainer images some, uh, as well, and then ship them on the HPC system. So they have them before uh, they get the system to build the containers, but now it's been deprecated. Even so, the, the system was different, a different architecture from the HPC system. So when you start building your application, you need to be aware that uh, the two machines were completely uh, two different machines. So you didn't have GPUs, for example, on the building machine while you will have on Jurek. So if you want to build a machine that supports and runs off on GPU, you will end up having some concerns uh, to be solved. Unfortunately, there is no template uh, available from Jurek to start with. Uh, Galileo is a similar situation, but um, there are two systems, a uh, scalable computing system and a cloud computing system, and they use the same type of nodes. Uh, these are Intel uh, nodes, and the, the difference between the two systems is that they use different interconnection. One uses InfiniBand, the scalable computing, and uh, uh, the cloud computing uses the Ethernet interconnect. So when you build your container, you have the same computing hardware, but a different network interconnection, which creates some issues. And we'll talk about it later. So the problem with the containers that uh, I, can, I see is that when you start using MPI, and especially MPI across several nodes, so large HPC system with the proper uh, interconnections. So there are two different models you can have for using MPI inside the containers, and we're taking as a reference obtainer. So Ptenic supports two different implementations of MPI, MPI-CH and OpenMPI, and both support GPUs. So you have two different models. One model is that inside your container, you install your MPI version. So your application is built against the MPI version installed in your container. Or another model is that you don't install the MPI in your container, but you link the MPI version that you have on the host system. Um, that creates, uh, you can imagine, some of the problems of portability because uh, if you move the container on other hosts and the 
directory is in a different MPI is installed in different directory, then you need to take care of uh, how to solve this problem. So the bind model, uh, basically, you you need to create your container, build the MPI application outside because you don't have the MPI library inside uh, when you build the container. So you build the container and the application on the host, and then you copy the application inside the container. So the problem here is that you need to know where um, in case located in the host. And uh, the administrator of the machine has to give you, allow you to uh, use the binding of the folders inside the container, which is not guaranteed. And you need to be sure that uh, um, the MPI you're using on the host is compatible with the MPI you use um, building the application. So if you move the, the container on different machine, you can end up having two different versions of, of uh, MPI and you can have some conflicts. And that problem arises for uh, the GLib compatibility um, because uh, it needs to be a more recent uh, uh, in the container than the host. So in case uh, you don't respect this precedence of dependency, then your container will not work. So this compromises portability and uh, can be used as a solution where you have other constraint on the HPC system. So it's the only way you can, you, you can work around. Otherwise, it's, I will not suggest that you use this approach. Um, the, the, the positive thing is that the uh, container would be more lightweight than uh, the hybrid mode. In the hybrid mode, instead, you install everything inside the container. So MPI, the drivers for networking, and the interface for Zoom is, uh, is set up as well when you compile the MPI. So what will happen is that the MPI will communicate with the host, so in the scheduler and the interconnection. So what is the limitation here is to be sure that uh, the two MPI are able to communicate. So why is this the case? Because if you take, for example, what happens when you launch an MPI application, you basically on the host, you run an MPI run, which fork and launch Horton, the daemon, and then this takes care of the MPI communication when uh, the other uh, application are forked and allocated in the different nodes. So in the case of singularity, is the obtainer, which is forked and allocated in the different nodes. So then the application inside the container running MPI is launched. You will have the situation that where well, the, the MPI application running in each container will need to communicate one with the other, and they need to go through the interconnection to make the communications. So uh, obtainer makes the link between the two MPI versions, but it's up to uh, who developed the container to make sure that the two versions are compatible. In pragmatically, to do uh, the, the run is quite easy. Is, uh, what you expect when you run MPI run for a, a normal, let's say, MPI application. So as long as the MPI version in the container is compatible with the MPI version on the host, you will not have any problem. Um, the lesson is that uh, it's not to always what you expect. So the general rule is that uh, um, MPI is backward compatible, but MPI is a standard, and then the standard is implemented by different providers. So you have Open MPI, you have Open OpenCH, everyone can can make a different implementation. So there are different, there's a system to check what uh, are the difference with the, between different uh, uh, MPI version. So the, the big problem is that uh, it's not always the case that uh, uh, there is backward compatibility. You see in you know, all of these cases, uh, there are glitches that uh, arises. And this may change with different, let's say, subversion of an MPI, but at the time we, check this uh, compatibility, we found issues. So if you have a container, the same version of MPI, if you have MPI in the, the same version, the container and the host, you will see in green that there is no issue. If you have different version, you will have issue. Considering that uh, 
what is required is that the MPI version in the host is older than MPI version, uh, sorry, the MPI version in the container is older than MPI version in the host. You will, you will not expect uh, to have incompatibility here. This is due to a change in the API, uh, uh, in the MPI API. So clearly the compatibility extends also to the process management interface, uh, as well as to the, the driver that uh, takes care of the interconnection. So if you don't configure properly the uh, MPI library inside the container, uh, there is no guarantee that you can have uh, uh, a running container with the correct performance. So I want to stress the fact that the con if you run the container on a single workstation, even with MPI, you don't end up uh, in uh, being reproducibility issues and so on. And the problem arises when you have a cluster with the different tech connection, with different settings, configuration that you need to take care of. So uh, the advantages of using MPI is that uh, you can use Slurm. It's simple to uh, work with because it's the same, um, basically, principle of, of building an MPI application. The drawbacks are that you need to be careful about the compatibility between the MPI version uh, the host and the container. And then you need to be careful in uh, uh, make sure that uh, um, the container is properly configured uh, to uh, understand the hardware on, on the HPC system. The simplest and the standard approach is to build the container with the same MPI version in the host that is in the host, but this is not always possible. Another complication arises when you want to uh, build a, a container that supports GPU systems. Uh, in that case, my advice would be to start from a container which is prepared by the manufacturer of the GPU you want to work with. Um, the problem here is that uh, even though CUDA and uh, ARM GPU are supported from obtainer, uh, you need to be sure that uh, uh, the GPU driver and the library are installed correctly and the, with the correct versions. Otherwise, you can end up having uh, compatibility issues with the libc, for example. The lesson then I can summarize is that uh, in both systems, even though Singularity or Obtain are installed, uh, you are not allowed to run the build on, to build a container on the uh, login node or on the HPC. That's not allowed in both systems. Uh, it's possible in Chineca to use a virtual machine uh, in the cloud, like I showed, you, I showed before. Uh, but it's challenging to have start the proper MPI configuration uh, unless you have a proactive support, uh, IPS support. And Julich, uh, unfortunately, they are not supporting anymore the system. They're not going to they deprecate the system for building container. So that could be a challenge to build a container somewhere else and have the right configuration when you ship in, uh, in Julich. To continue on the same uh, line, what we wanted is that uh, uh, the container we build, uh, they could be deployed in cloud. And we got uh, uh, a collaboration with the, the SURF uh, uh, Institute and the uh, University of Amsterdam. We got an allocation on their SURF, uh, the research cloud infrastructure. So the container we had that could be just deployed on uh, uh, this system and offered in their catalog as an uh, application uh, among their applications. So basically you have the infrastructure as a service. You just uh, um, ship your container in a virtual machine. It's very efficient because the virtual machine starts and stops in less than one minute. It's available both Docker and, and Singularity. Uh, but the dis disadvantage is that uh, you need to manage everything yourself. It's a nice paradigm because basically once you have your research ready, your software is done, you can just deploy in cloud. And you, don't have to, you can just share with your colleagues and uh, the application can be run uh, smoothly. We, uh, in this uh, project, combined project, we took care of, of containerizing one application. Uh, one is a parallel framework for image registration. Um, regist image registration basically is that process that uh, um, allows you to find a mathematical function that maps two images. The, one image is the so-called fixed image, the starting image, and the other image uh, uh, 
has gone through some modification. Let's say if the patient moved during acquisition of some uh, MRI scan, for example. So you find this function that maps the two functions. So you can, uh, let's say, overlap any mis mistaken acquisition to the original one. There is a, another application of this uh, registration, which is uh, actually, if you manage to have uh, an ideal, for example, in this case, a meshing of uh, a um, backbone of a patient, you can use this mapping application to apply the same meshing uh, to the other image. In this case could be a reference patient and another patient. So if you find a mapping between the two, you can actually uh, translate the meshing of the spine to the other patient, which simplifies uh, the process of uh, uh, doing the modeling. This requires a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, resources. So we need to use the HPC for doing these processes. And uh, we add also a complex, uh, let's say, tree of dependencies. So <clears throat> this application works on Linux and uses MPI. And on top of this one, there are the dependency like uh, PETC, image format, image libraries, and so on. And uh, you can imagine that there are, there are difficult, uh, let's say, relationship between all these libraries with different version works uh, rather than uh, other, and they need to be aligned with the, uh, the corresponding version of MPI and so on. So what we exp uh, explored here <clears throat> is the modularization uh, possibility with the container. So you can think of, about a container like a library. So when you build your container, you can actually include other, contain other containers. So for example, we build, we create a container for the different Linux distribution we wanted. Then we created another container on top of this one. So basically the MPI container where we install MPI uh, includes the previous container. So when you want to build the MPI container, you do, don't do the work to rebuild the Linux container. So you just added the difference and it goes up in the, in the, in the stack. So when you want to build the preferred dependencies, you can just include the previous container without rebuilding everything, which simplifies the building process, but also allows to manage more effectively the, uh, let's say, the matrix of flavor of different uh, library versions. We found this very useful in two different scenarios. One, to uh, deploy the application to our users so they could uh, actually start using the application without installing anything. And in five minutes, they were just ready to uh, use the application. But also we find it very useful in the continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, because with the containers, singularity containers, we could even test the uh, MPI side of the, um, of the application. So not just the um, unit test and delegation test for, uh, uh, let's say, um, sequential uh, problem, but also running in parallel on a cluster, on a cluster machine. So we have two different pipelines, one for the, let's say, the external uh, user, uh, the usual CICD uh, pipeline, and then internal one we could uh, run on HPC systems. So let's go and see what is the moment, uh, the horizon on digital twin. So the Virtual Physiological Human Institute uh, is running this project, it's called EDIF, it's a coordination uh, action and they have four objectives which is mapping the, the ecosystem of, of digital twins available at the moment especially in Europe and uh, developing a roadmap and see what are the next steps what are the issues and try to influence the policy makers to support the development of the digital twin in the future and uh, then implementing a federated uh, cloud-based repository of digital twins and design a platform that can be used uh, as a digital twin for uh, the whole community. It's an ambitious process, process but it's two years, and then we continue after this one, and there are three different phases. You will find in this link the, the roadmap, which is an interesting, uh, let's say, um, recollection of uh, uh, the current uh, state of the art, the current situation of intercession in digital twin in Europe. Uh, 
In Sheffield, we got a grant uh, from the Research England uh, to develop what is called the Bank of Sustainable Software. So our idea is that uh, to make sure that the models that are made for digital twins uh, satisfy some, uh, let's say, quality constraints, we want to uh, create a system where uh, they can, the software can be reviewed and curated. So let's say you, you, a researcher has his own software and data where he can test and uh, validate uh, uh, the application of the digital twin. So when they have this model, this software with data, they can upload to the platform where they can store permanently, but also yeah, they need to run, they, they need to be peer reviewed. So they, they, they will run against a set of tests uh, to make sure that the uh, quality of software is correct, there is verification, validation, and then they are ranked and they have to go above a certain threshold to be, let's say, um, minimum quality guarantee to be used uh, for medical device or for digital twin. Um, the idea is that uh, all these models will be provided where possible as a containers if they are let's say, developed in Windows that will be virtual machines. So the key point is that uh, we want to guarantee also traceability. So in case there is some change or some issue with the model, the model is uh, as goes through another uh, peer review session and the curator will take care of to make sure that uh, the model is always uh, the correct version to run. So once the model uh, has been, let's say, approved for, for use, is uh, offered uh, externally through a web service interface for other federated repositories or virtual human twin frameworks. We also have plans to support this model on a long term. So if you want information or want to join this initiative, feel free to contact me. One of the first, uh, uh, let's say, uh, models we are, we are importing in this uh, uh, BOSS um, service would be the CT2S service. <clears throat> so it's a basically personalized digital twin model for uh, proximal femur to, um, to predict the, the risk of fracture of proximal femur using bone strength. So it is a pipeline using, uh, uh, let's say, three different uh, uh, models, which are Linux-based, and one is Windows-based. So the, what we want to do is make sure that uh, these three are containerized and uh, uh, can be used by uh, ported to HPC system and are validated and offered to the public. An interesting bit uh, where the containers are useful in this case is, for example, for uh, the bone strength analysis, Zans is, is switching support uh, uh, from CentOS to Ubuntu. So uh, actually, if you have system which don't run Ubuntu, you will need the, you can use a container to overcome this issue. We also have been working in the past in a, in a project, European project, which is on uh, computational horizon and cancer to on a platform for running simulation for uh, physiological human, um, which is, let's say, could be a, considered a base for further developing a digital twin. At the time, we used uh, uh, virtual machines for running uh, the models because the, the idea was uh, uh, to support uh, coupled models, complex coupled models, which were uh, relying on the Master 3 library. So um, this was, uh, uh, let's say, to solve, uh, to optimize, let's say, the execution of models that uh, are really tight and coupled together. Uh, this was uh, allowed in, in this platform, in this platform was allowed to, to run both workflows, but also yeah, support these coupled models. Clearly one limitation is that in case workflow relies on uh, uh, very light models, um, you will need to uh, pay the overhead of uh, working with on machines. So the use of containers will be an improvement. And one of the improvements we are going to work on is to uh, custom extend this platform to support federated learning for uh, uh, medical uh, data. So in particular for uh, MRI scans. So the idea of federated learning is that, that if you cannot access the data in different uh, uh, settings because of uh, uh, policies, uh, uh, sensitivity of data, 
you can train the data your model your ai model in the different places and uh, then try to build a federate model where you can actually have a better prediction or more complete prediction uh, rather than the single models so the idea is to exploit the let's say the container portability and uh, um, use them to uh, implement this development learning and that is uh, all for me and uh, we'll open for questions Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Daniele. Um, just a quick reminder for the audience that if you do have any questions, then please navigate to the Ask the Staff a Question panel, um, which should be accessible by the question mark icon on your screen. Uh, it should look a little bit like a uh, bit like this on the right hand side of uh, Daniele's screen uh, right now. Um, but please go ahead and type your questions in there so that I can read them out for you, uh, just to keep the session running smoothly and also so that people can hear what the questions are in the recordings as well. Um, and so just whilst we wait uh, for people to gather their thoughts, um, I actually had a couple of questions of my own, Daniela, if that's all right. Um, yeah, sure. And I suppose the first thing to discuss is, you know, what are what would the main limitations be um, to adopting Cloud HPC in uh, you know, research institutes, uh, institutes, for example? Um, so <clears throat> the, limit, the first limitation that we had uh, in, in Sheffield is that uh, it we wanted to use the cloud there is a financial problem that uh, basically the cloud provider they want uh, a credit card to, to pay for services so the university system doesn't allow uh, to do that so in sheffield we came up with a solution to use a third party company which deals with the cloud provider and actually negotiate also a, a better deal so we actually uh, prepay on grants uh, the use of cloud and uh, uh, this company basically uh, is an interface and then we get the access to cloud, cloud HPC. So th there is this limitation uh, as a first. And the second one is that the cost of using a cloud can escalate quite quickly. So the, the problem, the, that's the issue that we have is that we're willing to explore how to use a, a cluster in the cloud and, and start playing with the configuration. We run out very quickly of the credits on the cloud systems um, so it's difficult to uh, come up with a solution that you can let's say um, advertise you, you, you can publish and uh, for the public because uh, we we basically develop a research application so the time needed for doing that is quite uh, larger than uh, what you will need for doing proper cloud HPC uh, solution. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, and you know, you've you've spoken about the, your difficulties in um, building containers on a number of the platforms that you've tested, right? Um, why, you know, like you, you went into the reasons for why, but you know, like is it just that these systems, when they were being set up, it wasn't with containers in mind, or you know, like going forward, is it? Do you foresee us, you know, seeing more compatibility with upcoming HPC systems? I mean, for example, Gavin um, has pointed out in the chat here that um, Archer 2 um, is really compatible with containerized applications. Um, you know, is this something that you see more compatibility for going forward? Um, so when we started, the, we <clears throat> with some uh, uh, we started from with containers. So we had, the, for example, in the case of the fire, was a, a complex set of dependencies so we started immediately and we run an npi and uh, it seems to work very very smoothly because we're running on the same workstation it was a large work workstation the problem arised when we want to use an h on hpc systems so when i shifted the the container on hpc then uh, the npi was not configured such that um, was aware of the networking system underneath and the uh, the job scheduler the, the job scheduler like a, like a slur, for example, so it was um, a minor let's say issue, and then needed a bit of time to configure properly. Uh, once that was solved, um, the other uh, let's say uh, challenge is that it's not very <clears throat> um, common that uh, people use a singularity for developing HPC 
application in in research. So sometimes uh, you need to work very uh, close with the uh, the administrator to uh, check the configuration on PI on the cluster that is supporting what you want to do in your container. So that was my experience. Right, sure, sure. Um, and so I guess with that in mind, what would your suggested approach be for someone who is you know, looking to containerize their application? So um, we can end up using this reference here. So if you build in a modularized way a container, you can replace the container for MPI and just changing the configuration for this container. So you'll have all the other uh, definition file for all the layers that you want. But the, when you ship uh, the container to a different HPC system, you can just uh, change this layer with the right configuration. My suggestion is uh, um, to check with the IT service of the HPC system and uh, look for the uh, a template for uh, starting your development. Because uh, there, there are a few flags and few dependencies that uh, you need to uh, include in your container. So you need to be in contact with who configured the machine to be sure that you, you uh, set correctly everything. Otherwise, you end up uh, <clears throat> having errors that you don't really know where, where, where to go because you don't have the permission to go to admin stuff in the, in the cluster. Also, you cannot rebuild on the cluster. So you are going to shake back and forth your image from another machine. And uh, easily a container can end up being a one gigabyte, two gigabytes. Um, so that could be challenging to do this iterative process. So my suggestion is to start from something working, some container working from the uh, destination HPC system. Um, and that is uh, the, the solution I will adopt uh, for, for any work in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that advice. Um, I, haven't, I haven't received any questions from the audience as of yet, um, so maybe I'll, I'll proceed with um, another, one of, uh, the, another one that I have here. Um, so this one is related to the, the Bank of Sustainable Software, BOSS. Um, what are the sustainability plans um, that you have for um, for this bank of software? So the plan that we have for for this uh, is to allow to prepay the support for the different models. So there is uh, in our mind there is not much uh, let's say benefit in uh, developing a new product and put the product uh, publish the product the software and then forget about it. And in two, three years' time, it would be obsolete and not usable anymore. So for us, the <clears throat> publishing a software that, would, that needs to be used for a digital twin or medical research needs to factor in long-term sustainability. So we are in including this type of, uh, let's say, uh, support when we grant, we grant grants. So you can cost in advance uh, what is the requirement to make sure that uh, um, the software is uh, uh, curated in the future and uh, you make sure that uh, if anything goes wrong with the software you have a traceability system that you can flag back if you imagine you want to use uh, digital twins for a medical device you need to implement a system where if anything goes wrong for from the software side you need to kind of recall the, the use of the software from where it has been used and you cannot do that if you just publish a model a software somewhere like you do research and then you forget about maintenance of the software so this is the the main idea we have we have some something we're we're setting up in the next few months and so we will support uh, this type of uh, uh, service okay, perfect thank you thanks very much for answering my questions um, so we haven't received any questions from the audience, so um, seeing as if there are no further ones coming in in the next few seconds, um, then I suppose this is a good point to draw the session to a close. Um, so just a quick reminder that this e-seminar will be available on the uh, Comp Biomed uh, YouTube channel and website, which is uh, accessible via the link. Um, so if you would be able to go forward a couple of slides for me, please, Daniele. Um, there should be a link um, where people 
Uh, yes, this is the one where people can access um, past AE seminars and um, the, the recording from this e seminar will be uploaded there um, in the near future as well. Um, so before we end, I'm just going to take, take a moment to plug Combiomed's free scalability service. Uh, if you'd be able to go over to the next slide for me, please, Daniele. Uh, that's the one. So if you're someone who uses or even develops um, biomedical applications that necessitate intensive computation, um, but you're running into performance issues that, li that are um, limiting the scope of your research, then Comp Biomed offers a service completely free of charge uh, to improve the turnaround of your uh, computing jobs. Um, next slide, please. Um, so if this is something that applies to you and your research, you can fill out an application form available on the web page displayed at the top of the screen here. Um, otherwise, please feel free to reach out either at the email address shown here or via the In Silico World Slack channel. Uh, next slide, please, Daniele. Um, so In Silico World is a community devoted exclusively to In Silico Medicine, um, which offers expertise, opportunities for collaboration um, and a safe space to exchange ideas and advice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so already In Silico World, as you can see here, has a large following, including members from large biomedical companies, biomedical SMEs, independent software vendors, uh, clinical research institutions, and even regulatory and standardization bodies such as the FDA and NICE. Um, so that's everything that I just wanted to unplug um, at the end of the talk today. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you uh, once again, Daniele, for giving us your time today, uh, for giving us uh, this very interesting discussion on uh, containers. Um, and finally, I just want to thank everyone in the audience for attending and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day.